My name is Lee, Lee J. I'm gonna be hosting this panel, clearly. So, um, so how was it working with Seth MacFarlane? No, jo put it down, I'm joking. All right, I'm gonna ask y'all some questions. Some shit that, you know, I'm gonna ask y'all some different questions. Cause we'll see what happens here. You guys all right with that? I'm gonna start this way. Chad, had you ever worked with Peter or heard of Peter before you started working with him? Hell no. <laughs> I, I'm joking. No, no, I had not. I had not. How did you guys find that chemistry so quickly? Is it your theater background? Is it just your love of text, love of characters? What is it? Because you guys bring such depth to these characters. For my side, um, we're kindred spirits, man. This, this is my, this is my ba the baby brother I never had. And uh, we were both cut up <laughs> and zany thinkers and, um, you know, subversive sense of humor. We both got some pipes and we both love the theater. And for me, yeah, we both love the theater. We're both family men, you know. Um, so it was so many, it was an array of different layers to why Peter and I click. But I guess you could say at the heart of it is, I think, our love of the craft of acting and, and theater. But I'll let him speak for himself. You ready? You want to speak for yourself? You want to do it? Is it? Is it? Wow. Yep, just oh. hand it on over. Here we go. Just hand it on over because we only got so much goddamn time. Um, <laughs> I had heard of Chad, obviously, from like uh, uh, Wire and uh, uh, The Expanse and Woo. Pictures of Wire, you know. But in the episode of The Jeffersons that he showed up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the child. Um, and so, uh, and I know that he had, um, you know, big personality, a lot of, lot of presence, and I was really, really curious um, as to what he was going to do with uh, Clyden, because we were creating these, uh, these, these aliens from, from nothing. So it was, I was really, really excited to uh, finally get to, to play some scenes with him, because when we started, it was just me. And then with the with the with the pilot, and then when we came back and started shooting the season season one, we finally got to get together, and and it's really interesting to see somebody whose work that you admire uh, to, to to get to work with them, and so all the stuff that you admire, I, that I admired about his work, it was really um, wonderful to to have that um, level of excitement because um, I got to see his work, and I knew what like the kind of work that he he turned in and did and it was it was, a, it was so wonderful to finally have that to play off of and all of my sort of fanboy you know energy with a character then who was my mate you know what i mean so it wasn't like we were just casual friends or whatever but we were intimate family members and so that was really really exciting and and because like he said chad said we we come from the theater and i've been talking about imagination work but to be able to ask each other questions, a huge level of trust, you know. So when we were having the, when we had to wrestle in the food, you know, like I've, I've done, you know, probably 30 years worth of stage combat. And the first rule is that you take care of your scene partner and make sure that they're, they're safe and that you're safe. And they do the same. And I just, ultimate amount of trust. So. Will well, you hand that to, thank, give it up for that. Hand that to Mark. Penny, I'm coming to you in a second. Mark? Hi. Hey, Mark Jackson. Hey, Julie. Um, so your, your casting was a little different. You weren't in America when you booked this role, right? No, I was in a place called England. <laughs> yeah. Which is having quite a big day today. <laughs> What's going on today? Not my king. Not my hey. king. <laughs> if any of you have talked to me about it, I'm not a big fan of the royal family, but... That's a separate conversation. Whoa, where's this diversity and inclusivity? <laughs> so moving on, my question for you, Mark, playing, do you get offended when people call you a stupid robot? Uh, it's only you, Jay Lee, so okay. um, <laughs> over uh, the years I've gotten used to it, to be okay. fair. Yeah. So then the other question is, what do you, would you say is the hardest part about playing Isaac, and if I may just give you a little bit for it, as actors, we have to listen a lot. And a lot of times, we're so busy thinking about what our next thing is, you know, Isaac is always paying attention and listening. So 
what, do you, what is the hardest thing and the easiest thing you found playing Isaac? And what do you, as Mark, who's very lively and lovely, bring to such a stoic sort of con contemplative character? Three questions. Thanks, J. Lee. You got it. <laughs> Um, well, for, for anyone who was at the panel yesterday, apologies if I say this again, but um, I was thinking about, well, Chad was talking at the panel in depth about playing Clyden and all the layers he's got there, and I was thinking, oh God, if someone asks me this on a panel, I don't know what I'll say, because actually talking about playing Isaac's really difficult, because he's not emotional, uh, he's, you know, he's very logical, he's very efficient with everything he does, he's essentially completely inhuman. Um, so, you know, that was quite difficult to do because every actor, every actor goes, oh, I want to be naturalistic and really believable and, you know, just completely like submerge the audience member into the world that they're in. But with Isaac, of course, that would be the, the end goal. You can't do it through the naturalistic route. So that was quite difficult. The other thing, obviously, is wearing the suit. Um, because it stops Talk about how much you love that suit. Using... <laughs> I love that suit. Um, talk about it. Okay. Uh, well, my relationship with that suit is a five, six-year odyssey, really. Mark doesn't like the suit. I... It's a very... If I may for it, it's clunky. You got to take the mask off. It's hot. It's a lot going on. So they're in prosthetics. A lot of aliens are in stuff. Mark's in the suit. You got to take it off. It's hot. It's a lot. You do a good job. He don't I like don't, the suit. I don't have to wear prosthetics, so that is like... It's true. Like, yeah, I can't whinge too much about it on set. I mean, I do whinge about it, but I try not to. <laughs> uh, no, the suit's fine. It's... And, you know, actually, it's been, a, it's been a battle with the costume department over the last three seasons to not just let it look good, which is basically all that the production company wants it to, to be, uh, but also to be comfortable for me and for me to be able to see and hear and breathe and, you know, all those normal human functions. Um, so uh, I had to even fight them to have a zipper at the front. So, you know, you can, you can so imagine you can what that's for. So you can pee. So, you can, it, so I peed it. For the first season, I peed in the suit, Got it. and then they finally... Uh, <laughs> okay, that's enough. Will you um, hand the mic to Penny? <laughs> Give the mic to Penny right now, please. Thank you very much. Well, what I was going to say, uh, oh, yes. actually, is it's just hard not using your face as an actor. Oh. So, um, and I, I discovered early on that I wasn't acting in the suit. I was puppeteering, and that was really useful because I could suddenly act through the suit rather than act inside it, if that makes any sense. So, um, yeah. That's good. I like that. Miss Penny, will you grab that microphone, please? All right. Penny, you've been around a lot of great people. I mean, you're, you know, you're around us. Are you going to ask me who's the greatest? No, I would okay. never put you in that boat. All right, yeah, yeah, all right. But uh, being a Star Trek sort of legend in the game and then coming over and lending your uh, amazingness to Oroville, what's the thing that you think you brought to this show that we didn't know we needed? Hmm. I'm not sure if I brought it to the show. I think that I really understood it coming into the show, and that is being word perfect. Because being word perfect was essential um, the, when doing Star Trek. And it was elevated language in that we were Shakespearean actors in the future. The Orville, however, as naturalistic as it may appear to be, we are word perfect. And to understand that if you change language in a sci-fi situation, you're not just changing a word. You are changing an entire meaning of why it is and what it is you're saying. Because a simple change is a change in rhythm. And in the future, words matter. Where have I heard that one before? Yeah. But words matter. So um, I think it would be that and uh, being present and being able to have fun, but always being that theater actor. And I don't know if I brought that to it, but on Star Trek, we were all theater actors. And in theater actors, you truly come prepared. Um, you come early. 
um, and you're off book and you're ready to play. So um, I think I just carry that with me wherever I go. I'm not saying it was absent you know, on the Orville, but I, I do know that that's something conscious that I, that I, I do. Grace, dignity, and humanity oozes, oozes. And it's not, again, just like she said, not to say that it doesn't come out of others, but it oozes out of her yeah. and everything she does. That's, that's what I think, that's what I get from you on the show. And on top of that, I will say, um, in doing this kooky, far out, you know, fictitious, you know, world, what, what I, I was comforted by, my character, um, I felt like there was a voice of, not, not my elders per se, but like that, that sort of steady hand of, of um, rational, uh, you know, uh, it's like, the, like when you would go and talk to your auntie, you know, about something. That, like the, so, so when we were going through our therapy sessions, you know, it, 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 I, don't think that, I don't think that there was another character on the show that would have been able to hold, yeah, like to, to, to hold all of that, the, the confusion of, 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 I don't know what therapy is, but you're going to, you know, you're going to treat my skin disease the same way you're treating my therapy. Like, there's something trustworthy about Dr. Finn um, and that she's a parent. I'm literally and a, going to cry. Um, but the, the, the sort of steady, you know, um, the voice of reason um, when there's a lot of huge conflict, the, the fact that she was willing to sacrifice her career for Topa's surgery. Um, but there's like a Dr. Finn, for, for, I feel like for Bordis, was always this voice of calm and, and reason, you know, and, and, and unless she got hot and mad, right. <laughs> and then like, watch out. <laughs> and, and I'll say this real quick, and then I don't know how much time we got, we can open it up for some questions, but also giving, right? I remember in season one, uh, you know, there's, we have a lot of cameras, we got a lot of stuff, right? So your eye lines can be a little off, but Penny's a vet, so she knows if camera's here, boom, I got to get my coverage here, I got to do this. It was when baby Topa was born, I'll never forget it. I, as John, the character, had never seen a Mocklin baby. So John, like the, the camera is above, uh, it's above us, I think, or coming this way. And John, I make the choice as an actor to just stare into the crib, because John is really fascinated. And although that's a cool character choice, Penny literally was like, I'm like, what? I'm fucking in my shit. You know what I mean? Bothering me. I'm... And she's like, she's like, the camera's there. I'm like, yeah, I know. She's like, okay. <laughs> and then I see the final scene, and then you can see everybody else's face, and my dumb ass is like, did I go, oh, and that was a very giving thing as an actor as well, so I want to give you props for that. Thank you. Thank you. But I have something to say, <clears throat> because John has been hosting this, and I promised him that I would tell this little secret, and I'm going to choose to tell it right now, and it's about Jay Lee. I don't know this story. I hate it. Cut he has camera. no idea. So Jay Lee has this school called Do Better. And um, he's always preaching about we all got to do better and do this and that. And I'm thinking, he better be preaching and walking that walk, right? So I followed Jay Lee. He was in front of me. He had no idea. It was two days ago on the streets of Philadelphia. I see Jay Lee walking across the street with a bag in his hand. He had been shopping. And so had I. And I just stayed behind him and I said, he has no idea it's me behind him. And he's just doing that little Jay Lee walk, you know, the little bag. <laughs> and this bum, I mean, a, he was stanky because I could smell him from behind. And Jay Lee just walked past him and the guy like, you know, was trying to 
get some money off of Jay Lee, and Jay Lee did like that, kept walking with his bag, and he stopped mid-step. And he turned around and he took his bag. He had just bought himself a meal and he gave it to the person. And I said, he's gonna see me. And the guy looked in the bag and Jay Lee went like that. Like, it's all good. And he turned around and it was a pep in his step. He never saw me watching him. And I said, just like a big sister or a mama, I said, oh, I didn't taught my baby right. You practice what you preach. Thank you. And you never saw me. Never saw me. You looked at me three times because you wanted to make sure that dude was okay, but you never saw me. You were doing good. So check out, well, you. Check out my dear son here. Uh, Do better. And one more thing, one more thing, one more thing, and then we're gonna open it up. But, you know, I wanna say something about Jay, right? Because Jay, Jay, like, okay, look at, look at just what's happened. So we, you know, we're without a, a, a panel host or what do you want, moderator, right? Jay jumps in, Jay keeps us, like, when we're 12, 13 hours in a shoot, Jay comes in with, like, strange, crazy energy. Jay, like, f keeps us on our toes, he makes us laugh, and Jay's a good dude. And if you wanna go, an example of turning lemons into margaritas, um, <laughs> You know, we, there was a, a mix up with our, you know, this is a new convention and like we was putting it together and we're, we're doing a damn good job for setting the precedence of how we're gonna do it next year. But you know, there was some, some, some confusion about how things were gonna operate. So all you need to do is go into vendor's room, right? And look at an example of someone who would be like, oh, I don't have this, so I'm gonna be mad about it. But look at, the, look at all the banners that are in the room. There's a confusion about the, the banners. Jay doesn't have a banner, what does Jay do? Not only does Jay just make his own banner, but it's, it's probably the best banner that's in the room. But this is the guy that, you know, comes up with it and doesn't complain, you know what I mean, and keeps us moving and just, you know, and I want to say that about John Lamar's character, underrated, but the smartest person on the ship, you know what I mean, um, and, and just keeps it moving. Person. I said person, person, it's, biological it, being. It <laughs> And, and, well, you and have tell you, yeah. we, we, and then when he drew it, right, he, he got a red sharpie and he started highlights, highlights, and he, and he had a red sharpie. He said, okay. "That's fire! That's, That's fire. fire!" Enough about me. It was thank a red you. sharpie. Thank you. Thank you. It was fire. <laughs> no, thank you very Jay much. Jay Lee, everybody. Jay Lee, Jay Lee, Jay Lee. Thank you. In the house. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if we have time, but I, I guess we can open up some questions. We can do like five questions, keep them short, and ask something interesting. Please. All right, I'm gonna just walk through. We're gonna see what's happening. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Yeah, no, you, you Oprah. You Oprah, Jay Lee. Come on now. The brother in that hat. What hat? Is yeah. So lovely. I, oh, come on, right, yeah, Jay Lee, you gotta got work it. the room now. Work the room, work come the on, room. brother, work the room. Right, what's your question? If it's do better, man, you look great. Don't ask no stupid ass question. <laughs> oh my god! I have to say the Topa storyline. Uh, yes. You know, with what's happening now in this country with the trans movement and uh, and the rights being taken away. Did the writers? foresee this happening? How did, you know, this whole storyline came at a time when, right before all this drama started happening, did you guys foresee that this was gonna be happening? Right, I mean, if that were the case, my God. Um, yeah. But no, but that's, that's, that's how was, that's some of the shit's going on. When they were writing that story, when they wrote it before uh, we started sh shooting, but when we were shooting it and first became privy to it, a uh, whole bathroom gate was going on and we were, people were trying to say where you can take a piss or not, like place. So that was going on. So no, I don't think it was, they looked in their magic ball and like, they were like, just like, yeah, there's gonna be some fucked up shit that's gonna still have to deal with. But it's just art imitating life, you know what I mean? And in and, and a mirror, so. Um, but we didn't know Gaze in Space was going to invite us to New York. I did, I and, did. I was, and, and, mm. and, you know, um, show two of the, the episodes and then have a panel that was, was led by a trans woman in, in a theater for the LGBTQ plus. And everyone was so moved. Oh. I mean, we, it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life. And again, I always say this because she's a huge part of this family. Imani Pullman, she's not here, but she's here. And on that day, Oh my goodness, it, that was an incredible experience. So did we know that it would have this kind of movement through 
you know, society in that way. No, we didn't, but we're, we're all humbled by it and grateful for it. A beautiful accident on purpose. Yeah. Shout out right, Seth there you go. Shout Ooh, out Seth McFarland. How about that one? A beautiful accident okay, right on here. purpose. Next question. It's a new show. Actually, going off of that, my question is directly to Chad because you had the two episode arc where first you leave and then you come back. Mm -hmm. Did that affect you having to go through that transformation as a character? Did that also affect your life as an actor? Oh, wow. Uh, my life as an actor, uh, no, Penny said it affected me. <laughs> for those who weren't there, Penny was like, Chad thought, oh, this is it for me. <laughs> this character's done. <laughs> Boy, this gonna have a new mate. <laughs> um, for me personally, I always felt, I was like, wow, this is heavy. But I felt the responsibility of it. And I said this yesterday. The responsibility is many are experiencing their parents and family members harshly turning against them. So I had to play it truthful. It, that, that's, a, that's an important reality. It, it couldn't have a soft landing. You got to feel it just like that. And maybe that might move somebody to go in a different direction. You know, seeing it outside of themselves and go, whoa, is that me? <laughs> and did I do that? Um, so I didn't know about the comeback, but he, Right after I did it, right, I don't, I wasn't lingering around <laughs> Seth per se, <laughs> but, but Seth he was did say, bags. Seth said, no worries, something else is coming, you know, so he might have been worried for me, you know, or what I was <laughs> experiencing, not knowing what was happening. If I had left Seth and had no inclination <laughs> of what was going to happen, I may have had a different experience, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but, but then the comeback, you know? And uh, the comeback with so much hope, that's the aspiration, you know what I'm saying? We get to do the ugly, harsh realness, but we also get to hand out some aspiration and to have others come to me and say, I just would wish that, I hope that my parent, my sister, my cousin, my uncle can get there, yeah. That's so. Um, yeah. Thank you, Chad. Then we got time for a couple more. Anybody on this side? Oh, everybody's scared on this side, I see. Go ahead. So I know Seth MacFarlane had talked about. Ah, uh, he's not here. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm playing. Go ahead. He talked about the different tone of when it was being produced by Fox versus Hulu, and that it was a lot more slapstick with Fox, and you were able to get into more diverse and deep uh, themes when it moved over. Can you talk a little bit about how you did that change? Oh, you got Penny, Jeff, well, um, yeah, what do you think? Actually, the last season that you saw is the show that Seth wanted to present to you from the very beginning. So, um, <clears throat> when you speak of the tone, we were always true to the reality. We, um, I, I, um, the arc, the three season arc, the first, it was funny, not a spoof. It was funny. Second season, it was sprinkled with funny. Third season, there are situations that are real in life that we just have to laugh at sometimes. And so that is the show that he always wanted to do. And I'm sure if given the, the chance, that's the show that you will continue to see because there's so much to talk about. Now, I would, I, I would just add this. I, I would add this, just real quick, just add that. So there are certain dynamics that you can't escape. Seth MacFarlane has a track record. Uh, people have a sense and perception of what he's doing. A lot of times, you know, from Family Guy. And so we had to negotiate that, you know. Remember the critics? In the beginning, man, what is this? Critics, what is this hybrid? What is this hybrid thing? What are you trying to do? What, what's going on? And also, just I think all of us finding the calibration of this hybrid deal that we got going on, and, and you know, finding the real, you know, uh, the level of tension, and you know, the level of um, levity. 
Uh, I think we got time for a couple more, but go ahead, Mark. Well, I just want to say, I think the third season when we moved was just so much braver than the yeah, other two. Well, I so agree. Yeah. Seth, you know, it allowed Seth to, to really, as we say, you know, like say what he wanted, but also give him the time to do it. I mean, you see the episodes are so much longer, so he didn't have to cut it down into sort of little um, bite-sized chunks for the adverts and stuff. So, yeah, I think that's a big one. I got you right here in the middle. I also want to apologize. What a bad joke for a great question. See? <laughs> yeah, Hold on, no, right that there. was a great question, brother. Thank you. I like the hat, too. Uh, I'm, I'm first dibs on the hat because I'm sorry. And it matches with you. I know, I know. <laughs> oh, okay. The, Oops. <laughs> okay. What was the most ridiculous thing about uh, shooting the entire series? Like, what was your... Most ridiculous or favorite moment? Good ridiculous or bad uh, ridiculous? Uh, either or. Uh, okay. Let's focus right. on good. I'll go with Peter and I rummaging <laughs> through the woods. In the, in the, <laughs> that was the most ridiculous fun, but I also pulled a hammy. So good. I just want you to know. Oh, man. And that, that, this guy, I'm going to tell you right now. I said, what is with the track star? Oh, <laughs> I swear to you. I working. swear to you. This guy. He yeah. comes out of the gate. Whoa. I said, whoa, Peter, you know, yes, on TV, we do things slower. Anyway, <laughs> the camera can't catch it. This guy was firing off, and now I got to be the competitor. No, no, no. And Let me tell did you. Did I not pull my hammy? No, no. Well, you, I'm, I'm going to tell you, 9,000 feet above sea level. <laughs> exactly. That's right. What we were running up in the Mammoth, uh, and, <sighs> and we hadn't, it was, we didn't really have a cast party. Uh, immediately or at all, I don't think. But but the night before, because they flew Chad, myself, and our two doubles, stunt doubles, up, and then it was just all crew, two private planes, and we, you know, and we got to hang out with the crew in a way that we hadn't hung out with the crew, and everyone was really happy and celebratory, and we're just up and they're buying shots, fifty dollars shots of scotch, and I'm like, well, I can't turn that down, you know what I mean? So we're just like, yeah, 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 yeah. you know what I mean? And like, and, and then five o'clock in the morning comes. And uh, and my brain is stuck to the side of my head, and to get up and get four hours into makeup, and again nine thousand feet above sea level, and then the whole day we're just running. And I was like, and I was running that fast because I was trying to outrun my hangover, and I was trying to outrun vomiting, which I did. Uh, and I also and it was hot, and it was hot, as and it was like the worst of the worst. But the, it was like. It was so great and amazing spending time with the crew in a way, but the cost of it uh, was was yeah. enormous. But and I also I think I re I tore a tendon in my my because I was hobbling for three months after that shit. Um, oh. But but it was you know you had to go for it. I have a, sorry I have a question I want to pose for us real quick because I also like we two things probably three but one I don't know. A number number A we can't do the show without y'all. Seriously, Woo! you guys have embraced us. It's been amazing. With that, who is somebody on set that works on the show who is an unsung hero that you would shout out right now? Crew, extras, wardrobe. It's just, there's somebody I'm thinking about, but I want to see what you're going to say. Mine is easy. Howard Berger. Oh, shout out Howard Berger. Howard Berger, go ahead, explain that. How, uh, the man has an Oscar. Are you sure he's not been shouted at before? <laughs> yeah. yeah, he gets his own panels. But I like, Howard's a great one. He developed all of the aliens, all the yeah. prosthetics, like Howard Berger. Everything. You know, that's, that's, what, um, that, that's really a hard question because I'd like to believe all my experiences on the show which is what's quite wonderful about the show, is that everybody actually gets to be celebrated. So um, that's a difficult question because I, th I think we're really good at making sure everyone is truly celebrated because every part of that show is unbelievable. I mean, Brandon, um, what is Brandon's last name? Yeah, for, yes, yeah. our special effects guy yeah, is um, amazing. I if mean, you look at, real quick to that, if you look at the ship from season one to season three, that's all Brandon. He's like a geek. I mean, a major geek. But you see him with this, his iPad, and you know he's doing stuff, and he'll go, hey, you want to see? You want to see this? Want to see this? And you're going like, how can I not see that? How is this guy even doing it? 
and our, our costume designers. I mean, even from the first year, I know that was a, yeah. like, like a hot. Wow. No, Penny, don't cheat. It was worn. It was I will worn. say, I will say the, the, the AD department because the, the, the first, like the second ADs and like, the, because oh, our yeah. schedule would oh. literally change uh, hour to hour to two. Like we'd start, we'd have a schedule the night before, but they would be there after everyone left Michaela. working on the schedule. Michaela, like, by God bless her. Like, yes. And because the schedule was always changing, and they always, she was always so graceful and so, ah, I'm getting my ass kicked, but I'm not gonna take it out on you. Um, can, like, but they would, the the schedule would change, and people, and they would always have to readjust, and they're always having to, you know, just juggle, and they just handled it with such dignity because they were constantly eating a shit sandwich, and like, and it would, but but they would like, I'm sorry, I know, here it is, the schedules change again, and you can't get mad at them because they're taking it from up top, and, and creative decisions are being changed. So they were always, and the whole the whole time, the whole all the every every season, they always some people got fired. Um, it was like, but it was just politely asked but, not to come back. But okay, yeah, <laughs> but they always had to 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 take it from the top. Whether it's the corporate or the office or or the uh, creative team, and then translate that into our schedules and our schedules changing and getting it to us and calling us and texting us in the morning and making sure that we're there because if we're not there, they get chewed out and even though the schedule. So I want to give it up to them. That's yeah, a great that's question because like they kept it running. Yeah, um, yeah. Mark, I'd say. Oh, yeah, that's, that one's quiet. This one's louder. Um, I'd say crafty. Or crafty, you guys would say. Do you know what crafty is? It's it's oh, the food before guys. Oh, before pandemic. Yeah. Before pandemic. They're there all day, three meals, you know, and spreads huge spreads of delicious food, donuts, everything you could possibly imagine. And Not I said during pandemic. One one day, clear. yeah, it was, it was a, it, during pandemic. It was a little restrained, but um, one day I said I, I quite like Diet Sprite, and then the next day, do, 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 Diet Sprite in my trailer as well. I mean, how lovely. I think we're talking about yeah. everyone. Is, everyone is great. Mine is, mine's a quick, let me see. There's a, this one is louder. It doesn't matter. Mine is Mike. He's one of our camera ops, and it's very oh, funny. When you're shooting, they don't care about any of the antics that we got going on as actors. We're always being goofy and silly and stuff, and the camera ops are like, we don't care. And they normally all wear shorts, and it's cold. <laughs> but there's this one camera op, Mike, who's amazing. And I remember I just re-re-watched House of Cards, and I was just on set, just chilling, and I said something about the show. And I'm like, man, this show is really great. And I don't even think I ever heard Mike's voice. And Mike was sitting like this behind the camera, and he goes, Fincher. <laughs> and I go, what? And he goes, dude, Fincher never tilts. <laughs> they don't know what? Know He's like, so exactly, right? Yeah. As a director, you can move cameras in a lot of different ways, right? You can tilt the camera up and down. You can boom it up and down. You can put it on the slider to go left and right. You put it on the crane to go back and forth. There's a lot of different ways. Put it on a gimbal. You can do a lot of different things with the camera. But Mike was just so spot on. He's, go watch it again. You never see the ceiling. Fincher, booms. <laughs> but then you look at his shot. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I can't tell. It's, it's, a, it's a great thing. It's a good thing, but it's also his style. But I'm giving Mike props because then you go look at your shots that you're in with Mike and you always look perfect. So I'm giving Mike props. All righty. Oh, hold that. Okay, um, I I'll tell you two more. I don't know how much time we got and then we got to get out. Back. This but back, yeah. What is the time? Anybody? I don't know, anybody know? What time? We ain't got nowhere to go, shit, I don't know. We'll go this way, then that way, boom. Oh wait, no, I told you first. Yeah, since this uh, show is about diversity and inclusion, uh, how would you like to see more diversity and inclusion on the show, whatever your ideas are? Can I ask that? Can I use that? Oh, no, it's not the thing. Um, hi. Um, so we need more gays on this show because there aren't any. Um, and by that, I mean anyone from the queer community, obviously. I have berated Seth on several occasions about this. Um, and, you know, the original line, he didn't quite say it, but Mocklins, and I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Mocklins aren't, aren't queer in that sense, because they are from, um, you know, they're, they're... A different planet. What? Right. It's not, it's not that origin to us. We don't know it right. that way. Right, exactly. Um, because you think you're from a, well, you don't, I guess, from a single-sex society. But, um, but yeah, so I am on 
to him about it because Star Trek is doing it and we're lagging behind. So um, he has promised me that if there is more, that it will be, it will be coming. So yeah. Great. Good. Awesome. Okay, we got a question back here and then we're going to see what happens. All right. Thank you so much, Ailey. First of all, before I ask... Look like an MC, you finna walk around with the mic. Let me keep, let me stay close to you. I'll be right next to you. We're attached at the hip. No, okay. Uh, question about representation, but before I do that, I just want to say you guys are so luminous. I mean, the the intellect, the soulfulness, the humor that you're bringing to this gathering, to this series, and to this genre, it's a gift. So thank you, thank you for doing that for sci-fi. Um, I was just having a conversation with Garrett Wang about representation in sci-fi, and I just wanted to get your take on what it's like to be, to be part of putting black and brown people in the future, and there being an image of, of our faces and our, and our phenotypes in the future. What's that been like for you guys? Um, just want you to talk about that. I will say... Oh, I oh so do you mind if I start? No, go for it. Black people and brown people didn't show up in the 80s beatboxing and doing kickstands. We've been around for a minute. We're going to be in the future. <laughs> if you don't have it, if you got an issue with it, shut up. Black, brown, if we're all, it's all in the future. It's happening, so it's all good. So that's how I feel about it. I don't even think it should be a big deal, and it shouldn't even be something that we applaud. I, I mean, I, I appreciate it, but also it's like, duh, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that's... No, but I yeah. was going to say, I was going to say, I used to play a game where I would watch a science fiction movie, and if a black dude showed up or a black woman, a brown person showed up like, early, I'm like, oh, that's the ass. They're dead. They're dead. They're dead. And sure enough, they would be dead. And what I want to say, going from being that, watching, loving the genre, loving, loving science fiction in particular, to being on a show where that's not the case at all, it was just a wonderful journey to be a part of that. And that's all I'm going to say, because I piggyback on what we just need to normalize fucking everything and let people alone, let people do their thing and, and, and understand that, that, you know, like this, it, that everyone is part of the, the thing. But, I, but to answer specifically your question, it was really fun to go from, okay, here we go again. How long are they going to last? Not ah, they're dead, you know, or in a horror movie, same thing, um, to be on a show where, like, you, you don't know who's going to get got first. So that's, and I feel like that's, that's evolution. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that um, Seth is colorblind when it comes to casting, and he listens to voices. So you, you hear this melody of voices, and some of us happen to be black, brown, or whatever. But uh, one thing in particular, when I was um, told that I was going to have kids, I, um, and I told this to a group of you, I pitched for my kids to be multiracial. Because, you know, I said, okay, he says the future at some point, you know, color won't matter. And I am so glad that I lost that particular pitch. Because Seth made them black. And it's really important that they are. What, why it is in, um, th that it's important is that in the future, when you no longer see us, let's say it goes on forever like Trek, you're going to see some black people who won't eventually just be white again. Because, you know, we're browning the races and then soon we will have a different kind of race. But it's important to embrace our differences. We are so excellent and exciting and beautiful when you just see all the... I call the world colored people. They used to call us that. But the world is colored people. There's so many different kinds and colors of people. Because white people, you are not white, you pink. <laughs> Some of you are olive. You know, and black people, we're not black. We're caramel, cappuccino, um, chocolate, <laughs> sweet dark chocolate. We are a lot, a bunch of stuff. And Asian people, you, you're not yellow. So I'm saying that we're just so beautiful. So I never want to lose all the different kinds of people. I don't want us to like say, oh, we just have one kind of race. I actually like it now. But again, I was trying for something else, and I'm so glad that I lost it. So I don't think that it will be lost in the science fiction that our kids see in the future. I think everyone will be represented. I heard that in 200 years, human beings won't have pinky toes. <laughs> <laughs> what I just want to say, we, we have to speak to power, though. And what is the hue of much of the power wielders in Hollywood? And we've got to be 
<laughs> more brown and what have you in those places. Yeah. So we are sitting here, we're celebrating Seth because of his consciousness as a quote unquote white male or Caucasian male, straight male, right? Who's look, broadening his horizons, no pun intended, but pun intended. I get that. Right? So thank you, and we applaud that. Yeah. But, you know, I want to see Jay Lee sitting right beside him in his position, understanding that we have the power to uh, affect these stories being told as well. And uh, just that representation and all those huge power places, those rooms. You know. and, and I'll say this, and then we can probably wrap it up as well. We'll everybody say some stuff. But uh, I'll say it's interesting when we talk about seeing ourselves on camera. And I, I say it all the time with the pendulum, right? Everybody has a moment where the spotlight's going to be on you, where we care, and then we're going, you know, we don't care about that anymore. We're going to keep going. And all of a sudden, you've been wanting your spotlight as a whatever just to be seen. And then, okay, well, we gave you all some time. Go this way. Oh, no, come back this way. And we just keep swinging it. I'm a black dude from St. Louis. And you actually said this to me, and I never thought about it, because everybody, there's a lot of fights to fight. But Pete was like, I don't think there's been like a version of you in space. No, it was Chad. No, it was you. It was Chad. I apologize. Chad was, and I didn't get it. I didn't get it. But he was like, yeah, this is a thing. And I was really thinking about it. And last year, I'm in a fraternity. It's all black. Well, not all black, but it's a black fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha. I was president. I go back home. I have a screening uh, for the first episode. Theater full of Midwest black folks who don't watch sci-fi, don't understand anything about the genre, and they're watching it, and I had a moment of like, damn. Like, these are, we're all my people, right? But that's who I grew up with, the cousins and the un uncles and the aunties and the bros and all that, and they're watching the show, and so I take that seriously as well, and, and, and it feels good to be represented to your point, no matter what, I don't even wanna start listing labels and then trail off, you know what I mean? It all matters. So I'm appreciative of it. I'm going to shut up and I'm going to pass the No, light. no, I, he's right. I just want you to understand what he's saying. It's in a room full of people that identify with him as he is because he's presenting in a way that is so authentic and true to them. Um, I guess... Uh, yeah, I, what, the, one of the amazing things that I've experienced playing Isaac is I've had a lot of people from the neurodiverse community tell me that Isaac, they feel represented by Isaac on screen. Um, and I, it, I did not see that coming. It was a complete shock. And I think it really taught me the lesson that um, you never know the effect that you are having on people in the world. And, you know, it's such... It's such a responsibility to make sure that you can have as good effect as, pe as you can, you know. Um, and remember the legacy that we all have and be responsible with that, is all I'm going to say. But, yeah. Thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you. Wait, give me the one. So uh, I was just going to say, if you guys want to talk more, come by the booth. We here. Come, some get a, so everybody's table, go say hi, go get an autograph or a picture or something. We want to meet you, we want to talk to you. And uh, thank you for having us. Mark, thank you for inviting us to this. And uh, boom, thank you. This is John Glover, and you are watching Fandom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Lionel Luther recommends it. Ah, have some fun. Follow your fandom.